All right, so we've done the basics on torsion. I just want to uh, cover one little thing here. And the little thing is uh, multiple torsions. Now, one thing I'd point out, I think this is 609, I'm pretty sure. Okay, one thing I'd point out is, uh, you know, when we're doing the linear stuff, you know, with normal stress, we have a formula, and the formula says delta is PL over AE. So this is axial. Now for torsion, what we've got is a formula for angular deformation, which is the angle phi. So instead of load P, we've got torsion T. We have the length. Instead of the area, which resists the axial uh, stress and strain, what we've got is the moment of inertia. And then instead of the modulus elasticity, we got the shear modulus, okay? It's the same formula, really. It's just adapted for torsion, okay? And so that leads to a couple other things, that there's some similarities in other things we do that are analogous to the axial stuff that we do. And one of those things is the multiple um, torsions, okay? So this is just like if you remember doing axial deformation when we had more than one force. What we had to do was find the reaction, and we had to find the force in each section of the bar we were looking at, find its delta, and then add them all together. Well, it's the same sort of thing with torsion, okay? So let's say we've got a motor here, and it turns the shaft, delivers the torque shown, and the shaft spins at uh, 1,750 RPM. Let's find the angle of C and the angle of C as it twists with respect to B, okay? So we're going we're gonna to assume that A is our reference point. We're going to figure out what C is doing with respect to A. That's uh, um, B, which is that angle sub C. And then also we'll figure out how C twists with respect to B. And then let's also figure out, after these loads are applied, what's the time difference between when B and C hit top dead center? Um, what top dead center means is 12 o'clock. If you've got something that's spinning, uh, you could put a mark up there and then mark every time it hits exactly 12 o'clock. That's referred to as top dead center. Okay. If you time old cars, you know, you're always looking at top dead center and what the delay and all that kind of stuff. Or you use a strobe light back in the old days. You used to do that when you timed it, when you did a tune up on a car. Not so much anymore, but used to. Used to twist the distributor, I think. Wasn't that it? And get the thing turned in. Yeah. Delay. Yeah, delay. Okay. Okay. Yeah, those days are long <laughs> gone. <laughs> but anyway. Um, okay, so we've got a few things going on here. We've got um, the diameter of the shafts. We've got the lengths. You know, we've got the material properties. And then I went ahead and found the uh, moment of inertia for the two sections of the shaft. That's actually down in the middle of the page. So this is all kind of the background information because we need T, L, I, and G. So we got G. That's easy enough. It's right there. Giga means 10 to the 9. We've got the length and right there. So we need the torsions and we need I. Okay, we've got the eyes right here, so all we need now is the torsions. Now, the torsions are probably the major part of figuring this stuff out. There's kind of a, a systematic way I have of doing these, which I like to use. There's other more informal ways of doing it, but I prefer doing it this way, um, kind of systematically. So what I want to do, I want to find these internal torsions in the bar. So the first thing I do is I find the reactive torsion, okay? And that's the torsion that the motor is putting in right there, such that these will be taken out, okay? So to take those two torsions out at B and C, your input torsion, which is the reactive torsion, is going to have to be the sum of those two things. Just go in the opposite direction, okay? So sum of torsions is zero, and then you'll have torsion A plus 120 plus 80, is zero, 
So torsion A is negative 200, meaning 200 uh, going into the page, essentially. If you roll your right-hand fingers that way, your thumb points to the left. Okay, so that would be uh, negative 200 newton meters is what that would be. Okay, and then from there you can work your way out because I think of A as being my reference point and I'll work my way out to B and then to C, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a cut between A and B and then another cut between B and C and then I'll put the uh, torsions there as I work my way out from the left to the right, from my reference point out, I'll be sure that I make the cut, take the entire shaft to the left because that's where the reaction is, where, where I'm referencing to. And then I'll solve for the internal torsions. Okay. All right, so that first one there, I've got 200 newton meters, and then I've got TAB. TAB then is positive 200 newton meters. So that's the torsion in AB. And then I can do a similar thing for BC. So it's just like the linear stuff that we did before with axial loading. Um, you know, you just start at your reference point. You know, I'm sorry, you make a cut at wherever you want to find the internal torsions. Take one whole side or the other whole side. Uh, in this case, I always take it back to my reference point. Okay, so I'm going to get 200 positive for TAB and then 80 positive for TBC. And, you know, that's how I do it systematically. You know, there is kind of some common sense to this because really all you're doing with this is just adding up the torsions that affect a certain spot on your shaft. So if I want to know what the internal torsion is right there, I could just add those two together and, you know, that, that's what it is. It's 200. And then if I want to find the internal torsion right there, it's just this one, 80. So, you know, there is kind of a quick common sense way to do it, but, but I'd like to be kind of systematic. So I'll go back, find my reactive torsion at A, then work my way out as I'm showing you here. All right, so um, we good with that, finding those internal torsions? Okay. All right, so once you got them, you know, I like doing my little tables here. So I just put everything in, T in Newton meters, L in meters, I in meters to the four, and G in Newton per meter squared. Just be sure you got consistent units. And then just plug everything into phi is TL over IG. And for that first one, I'll get positive 0.01797 radians. And that's positive. And then you can do the same thing for BC. Okay. And that'll be positive 0.02274 radians. So you just plug in the internal torsion, the length, I, and G. So what we're getting there is kind of the first one, the 0.01797 is, I think of that as being the twist of B with respect to A. Okay, so that's the twist there, that angle phi. And then the next one is the twist of C with respect to B. Okay. So if you want the total twist of C, what you do is you um, just add them up. Get the total. It's 0 0.0407 radians, which is about 2.33 degrees. Okay. So it's just TL over IG, calculate it. And remember, you're finding the twist of each section of that shaft. 
So if you want to find the total twist at the end, you've got to add them cumulatively, starting from your reference point and working out. So it's 2.33 degrees, 0.0407 radians. Y'all okay with that so far? Okay. Now there's also the bit where I would like you to find um, the time lag there. So let's look at that. See this kind of is getting to the idea of why you might care about the angle of twist. Um, you know, there's different reasons, but if you've got a machine, you know, a car is a good example, you've got to very precisely time when the valves open and shut on an internal combustion engine when, when the uh, spark arrives, you know, um, which is kind of, we were just talking about there a little bit, is getting that set just right. And, you know, that's a matter of, of very precise timing. And these twist angles, can if, if you've got... You know, you've got things on your crankshaft and your engine that's, you know, as, as it spins, you, that are opening and shutting the valves. There's a little lobes on the crankshaft that open and shut the valves. And you've got you've to be sure that that's happening at just the right minute or second or millisecond or whatever. Um, so really, that will depend. It, so if you have a twisting shaft, that could throw that off a little bit if you haven't anticipated it in, in your design. So to get that figured out, well, how much this, this twist is, could throw things off a little bit if you've got something happening at B that depends on something happening at C. So let's figure out what that would be. I'd, I'd take that 1750 revolutions per minute and I'd convert it into radians per second. Two pi radians per revolution in one minute is 60 seconds. So that eight, 1750 revolutions per minute becomes 183 radians per second. And then I'd look at the twist between um, B and C, because that's really what I'm looking at. Okay, so I'd look at the twist between B and C um, is 0 0.02274 radians. Okay, so I've got one second is 183.3 radians. So I'm going to have a 0 0.000124 second delay between when B hits the top at top dead center and C does. Okay. And that might be significant. It just depends on, you know, what, what I'm expecting to happen there. Okay. All right, any, uh, any questions on that? All right, why don't I just get you one of these to do um, about uh, 272, that should be a good one. We'll make that due on Friday the 12th and we'll push that one back a little bit, so. So 272, we'll make that due Friday the 12th. Hope everybody has a good weekend and all that.